Is there anybody out there? Oh, why, yes, there you are. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another fantastic episode of Amelia's Weekly Fish Fry, EE Journal's longstanding electronic engineering podcast, hosted by me, Amelia Dalton. This week, we're navigating through the twists and turns of automotive security. Mike Dick from C2A Security joins me for an in-depth discussion about the role software fluency plays in the realm of automotive cybersecurity, the ongoing issues surrounding cybersecurity lifecycle management, and why Mike believes that without visibility, we cannot have security. All right, let's go. Hi, Michael. Thank you so much for joining me. Hi, Amelia. Nice to join. Thank you. Okay, so first, Michael, since you haven't been on my show before, tell me a little bit about yourself and your past experience that led you to work at C2A Security. Sure. So many years ago, I was one of the co-founders of a company called NDS. NDS was a uh, company that dealt with conditional access for pay TV. Over time, it became the largest market share of companies that dealt with conditional access for pay TV. That's security for pay TV. You know, with customers around the world, uh, DirecTV in the US, Cablevision in the US, all the Sky in, in England, Sky Italia, Sky Deutschland, Tata Sky in India, many uh, customers around the world. And even during those days of NDS, we were looking at other ways of using the uh, expertise that we had in the company, which was a lot of embedded software and cybersecurity for other fields other than conditional access for pay TV. And one of the fields that we chose was cybersecurity for automotive. And we started working in that as well. Quite successfully, we had customers, big OEMs that we were offering services to, security reviews, pen tests, things like that. And then some years back, NDS was acquired by Cisco. And Cisco, after a year or so, uh, decided not to continue with that business. I had committed to remain on in Cisco for two years as part of that deal. But when the two years were up, I had left. And several of the guys that we uh, worked in the park, you know, in NDS days, approached me and said, listen, if you start a company that deals with cybersecurity for automotive, we're in, we're with you. What I said to them at the time, to be another company doing cybersecurity for automotive, because there are several that are doing it, is not really interesting. But what I am prepared to do is let's go speak to the OEMs and tier ones that we had connections with in the past, and let's see what's bothering them, what the issues are, what they'd like to see. If there's something that we can contribute, then let's go for it. And if not, not nothing lost. So we went around, we spoke to these uh, different companies, And based on the feedback, we decided to start the company. That's fantastic. I love that story. Now, there are many automotive cybersecurity companies, like you mentioned. What sets C2A security apart from the rest of the pack? And what are your guys' particular areas of specialization? Even in the early days of NDS, we had a team that were experts in automotive, number one, and cybersecurity as well embedded code, um, operating systems specific for automotive, things like that. So we started off from the, as automotive engineers, and then we brought in some additional experts from the Israeli army intelligence and places like that, which are known to be good at cybersecurity, to be able to let them bring the cybersecurity expertise on top of the automotive expertise. So we can actually come with automotive fluent from that perspective. So when we talk to the customers, we talk in their own, in their language with regard to automotive. Not like many of our competitors who were, you know, dealt with cybersecurity either in IT networks or aerospace or whatever. And now they're trying to port that into automotive, which is a a different story. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that based on the discussions that I mentioned earlier on that we had with the different customers before we started the company, we learned a few principles which we've based the company on. And those principles are specific to the automotive industry. They talk about white box approach. In other words, that we have to let the customers see what's under the hood. They are able to control the systems, configure them, uh, use them the way that they want to use them. It's easy to do a proof of concept in a lab somewhere at a car manufacturer's site and to show them that something works. But it's much more difficult to deploy 
millions of units out into the field and to know how to manage them, how to do ongoing cybersecurity lifecycle management, how to update them when needed. That's already, you know, a different type of expertise. It's not usually a startup type of expertise that is found in, in startups. And that's something that we bring to the table. And the other issue is also, you know, car manufacturers are not really manufacturers in the traditional sense of the word. They're more integrators or assemblers. They're doing more and more development, but still generally they specify systems and they get tier ones to manufacture them and then they have to put them all together and it has to work. One of the biggest challenges that the car manufacturers have is integration to get things to work together seamlessly. So we put a big, big focus on integration and we solve the integration issues in two ways. Firstly, software only. We only do software. We don't have to add to the bill of materials of the vehicle or anything like that. And second, we know how to work with existing components in the vehicle. We don't demand additional components or stronger CPUs or more memory or anything like that. We know how to work with existing components. Second thing with regard to ease of integration is that we are working with some of the main contributors to the automotive industry from the silicon and software perspective. So, you know, because silicon providers or component providers such as NXP and Marvell and others, so we have uh, agreements with them. We've done pre-integrations. We are able to show that using their hardware, we can get very good performance results off the shelf. There's no integration issues with it. And also on the software level. So, for example, there's a operating system, a safety operating system that runs in probably every vehicle. It's got something that runs AutoSAR, type of a specification for a safety operating system. The biggest producer of AutoSAR today is probably Vector in Germany. And we've done integration of our endpoint protection with Vector on a source code level. So, you know, if you have a safety application running in your vehicle and you want to use endpoint protection with three clicks, done and dusted, and you don't have to worry about the integration issues. So from that perspective, we are, you know, very much automotive focused and have done a lot of background work in order to be able to be accepted into the automotive industry. This life cycle management also gives us opportunity. I think we're unique in the sense that not only do we offer embedded security to find solutions for car manufacturers or tier ones, but also the ability to manage the life cycle of those products for the 10 or 15 or sometimes 20 years that those cars are in the field. Like you may know, for example, your PC or your mobile phone or anything that's got a lot of software and you'll find that on a regular basis there's updates, security updates for Windows, for iOS, Android, Office, any, you know, you get these updates all the time because there's security vulnerabilities that are found. There is no system that does that automatically today for automotive and that's something that we're now able to provide the, the industry. Let's step back a little bit. What do you think are the key issues that automotive cybersecurity ecosystems are really grappling with? And how can we overcome these issues? And what are the role of suppliers like you guys in solving these issues? You know, we have cars more and more are connected. You know, most cars are connected today. They're getting more and more autonomous as well. So you have ADES type features, for example, cruise control, adaptive cruise control, and keep lane assist, and many of the new cars, they've got all these types of features. And what does that feature mean? It means that there is a computer in the car that is actually controlling these safety systems. It's either turning the steering wheel or putting on the brakes. It's a computer doing it based on input from a camera or whatever. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that the cars are becoming more and more connected. So the same car is also connected to the internet, connected through Wi-Fi if it's an autonomous car, or et cetera. And all these systems are controlled by computers. The same computers are connected to the outside world and are connected to the safety systems of the vehicle. So just imagine that makes a very high risk that somebody from the outside, if they are able to penetrate into that vehicle, through the same computers can have control of the steering and of the brakes and of the engine and the battery power management and all these safety systems in the vehicle. And that's really dangerous. And as time comes on, the more software you have, the more attack surfaces you have, and therefore the more dangerous it becomes. And I'm not sure that somebody 
who buys a car in the future, especially an autonomous car, but even a well-connected car, would feel safe if they don't know that it's protected, cyber security protected. The same way as people are scared to use a laptop without uh, an antivirus system in it. Same thing with, with vehicles. So, so that's the big challenge. And the problem with it is that it's developed into a software market. It never used to be. Ten years ago, all the industry, whether it's the car manufacturers or the tier ones, were used to making hardware and connecting things together and mechanical engineering and production and things like that. And they never bothered bother too much about software. All of a sudden, there's more lines of software in a vehicle than there are in your PC or your laptop or even a, a space rocket. And that is like becoming a big challenge for them. They weren't prepared for it. And the systems in place that are needed, you know, in other words, software has to be controlled now through the whole, you know, we've described how the tier ones produce stuff and give it to the OEMs. That software is now produced by tier ones and by the OEMs and by multiple parties in the supply chain. And that has to be managed now. And that has become a, or maybe the big issue. You know, how do you manage all this how do you make sure that your software is coordinated between all these just multiple parties, etc.? And you need a lot of visibility and traceability in your software, like they have in other industries, which it doesn't exist today. So those are some of the challenges that we have. So you guys recently released a state of the industry market report surveying the automotive industry's readiness for implementing ISO 21434. Now, tell me a little bit about your market research and what do they indicate about the strengths and weaknesses to the current approach to cybersecurity and lifestyle management? Yeah, so it is really interesting. You know, we went to the industry, all different types of players, car manufacturers, tier ones, suppliers, a list of questions. And based on the responses, we put together a report. So, as I mentioned, from the visibility and traceability perspective, over 50% found that they are not up to speed with that. In other words, they don't feel they have enough visibility and traceability in order to be able to do a good job of cybersecurity or lifecycle management. And without visibility, you cannot have security because you need to know where you're affected before you can decide if you need to fix anything or not. The other thing is like, we call it risk assessment, but if you have a problem, you know, every week there's vulnerabilities being published, etc., about uh, different uh, components and software components having vulnerabilities. Now, let's say something is published and you want to know if you're affected. How long will it take you to do that investigation? We asked the car makers and the tier ones, etc. And we weren't surprised, but it's actually surprising objectively to look at that. It's more than three weeks. Now, you know, you're talking about safety systems. You're talking about people's lives over here. It's not acceptable. It's got to be instantaneous. You can't wait three weeks just to do this investigation and find if you're affected or not. Right. This is something that everybody agrees that we spoke about, that this is not acceptable. We have to have some type of automation, some way of doing this in a better way. The third issue was... What is the biggest thing that's impeding this time? Why is it taking so long? What, you know, why don't they do something about it? One of the main issues, over 50% of people said that it's because, you know, the multiple, we spoke about the supply chain. So you have different suppliers supplying different components with different software. And all these supply chain and car manufacturers, they all have to be coordinated in order to make do a proper risk assessment. You need this information to be coordinated. And that's just not happening today. There's no uh, coordination between all these. You know, it's all new. They never thought about this before in the past. The lack of automation was like over 35% said of because of the lack of automation. Uh, one of the additional questions that we asked, who should do the risk assessment? Because generally you might say, okay, the OEM is responsible. He should do the risk assessment. But it turns out that it's not really possible for him to do all the risk assessment because of the supply chain, etc. Well, you know, the results that we got that every, every component owner should be able to do his own risk assessment and then maybe the OEM will be able to take all that information together and be able to do a proper end-to-end -end risk assessment. Over 70% of the respondents said each uh, entity should do their uh, own risk assessment. Asking, okay, so what would be the challenges to adopt this ISO standard? A lot of, you know, over 60% said that there's no concrete implementation ready to allow them to seamlessly implement 
this new ISO standard. This is something that we've taken upon ourselves, and that's what we intend to do. Okay. Well, Michael, let's let's look into the future a bit here. Um, where do you think the automotive industry is going to be in the next 10 years, say? Well, firstly, I think there's no choice with regard to getting more up to speed with cybersecurity solutions and to find solutions to all these problems that we've just mentioned, because, you know, eventually the consumers will vote with their wallets and they'll be scared to get into an autonomous car or even a semi-autonomous car if it's not secure. And it's just a matter of time before, you know, we have malicious attacks. Not only that, but, you know, there's now, as you mentioned, the ISO and there's also the UNEC WP29, which is in-vehicle cybersecurity lifecycle management, which is now compulsory going to be from 2021. So there's no choice for the car manufacturers to be able to do to implement that. Otherwise, they won't get type approval. You know, the type approval in many countries will be dependent on implementing these different standards. So it's going to be compulsory for them, and there's going to be a rush to be able to become compliant from the car manufacturers. <laughs> As many in the car industry have said in recent times, that the car industry has to become more and more software affluent. They look at Tesla, started out as a software company. They knew that they were going to, this is, you know, that the, this is a software, it's like, it's like a computer on wheels. They've implemented what they need to do in order to be able to manage such software. And the industry has to catch up. Uh, and they've got no choice if they want to exist, if they want to survive, that's what they're going to have to do. That makes sense. All right, Michael, it's time for your off-the-cuff question. Sure. And since you haven't been on my show before, I'm going to throw you my standard off-the-cuff. So if you could eat one thing right now, doesn't matter where it is in the world, if the restaurant's closed, doesn't matter. What one thing would you eat right now? So the truth of the matter is that I have a bit of a sweet tooth. I know it's not healthy for me, but when I, you know, sometimes uh, you have to uh, enjoy life and I go into the different types of cakes and things like that. And there's um, one particular type of cake called a poppy seed cake, which is um, something that firstly my wife knows how to make well, but uh, <laughs> some others as well. <laughs> and a cup of tea with a poppy seed cake is something that I'll always accept anytime. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds wonderful, especially right now to me. <laughs> well, Michael, I think that's all I have the time for today. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you very much for your time and uh, interesting conversation. Hey, have you checked out EE Journal on social media yet? Well, you should. You can find us at facebook.com slash EE Journal. If you're into Twitter, you can monitor our tweets at EE Journal TFM. And don't forget, if you want to follow my personal Twitter account, check out Amelia D 1978. And hey, if LinkedIn is your thing, you can follow us on LinkedIn as well. And we have a YouTube channel, youtube.com slash EE Journal. Folks, it is chock full of all kinds of techie videos, including our very popular Chalk Talk webcast series hosted by yours truly. And by clicking the links below the player on this week's Fish Frying page, you can subscribe to this here podcast through Spotify, Podbean, the iTunes, or a whole lot more. And remember, if you want any further information about the stories covered in today's show, just head on over to eejournal.com and look for this week's Fish Frying page. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. If you know of any cool new technology or, heck, you just want to chat, shoot me a line at amelia at eejournal.com or post a comment on our forums on eejournal. For the week of September 18th, 2020, I'm Amelia Dalton, and you've been fried.